Ready. All right. Welcome everybody. Uh, this is the first in a in what we hope is a series of uh, programs that BNC, CPJ is going to do about the increasing repression at home and around the world, of course. Um, uh, Joe Ospake Baker is um, from a couple of organizations in Chicago. I'll let him make his own introductions. But um, we're sponsoring him today jointly with uh, the local chapter of the ACLU. And uh, he's going to be talking about the FBI raids on various peace activist organizations and individuals in 2010, late 2010, right? Um, we ha have, um, and we have, um, Refreshments, coffee, hot water for tea, tea, uh, snacks and cookies. Mm. Um, so help yourself as we'll take a little break right before the question and answer period and um, go from there. And in addition, we have the Illinois uh, People's Action Organization has a Valentine <laughs> Uh, campaign to Governor Quinn on gun violence. No, no this is banned fracking. <laughs> well, we have a gun now. We have the first cause. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, the materials for that it's a Valentine. You, there are instructions, and then the Valentine itself. You know that we can mail into Governor Quinn. So if everybody wants to take one of those before we leave today, we. Be happy, and I'm going to circulate this sign-in sheet while Joe is starting his talk. Okay. Um, thanks, uh, Jan and Corey and everyone for inviting me. Um, you know, I have to confess that it, I don't think I've ever actually been in Bloomington. I've driven past a uh, hundred <laughs> times because I'm a I'm a, an employee of the University of Illinois, and I'm a leader in my union of service employees, and I've been to protests in Springfield and Urbana for 20 years, back and forth and back and forth, and I know so many people from uh, Bloomington who, or who went to school at ISU, it's just, um, I, I feel a little embarrassed that I've never been here before. Welcome. Thank you. It's great, it's great to be here. Um, and I saw one bumper sticker on a car in the um, parking lot, I did have to do this check-in. Who's from Iowa originally? There you are. Okay, <laughs> my countrymen. Um, <laughs> I didn't have it in my car, though. I just. Uh... Oh, somebody else. has got one of those native, yeah. just the shape of the state. Oh well. <laughs> anyway, I, I'm originally. I, I'm from Iowa. I was born and raised. I was born on a farm. Actually, I was born in a hospital, but you know, grew up on a farm. <laughs> yeah. um, and um, and then uh, moved to Chicago in the mid-1980s to um, my, uh, my girlfriend at that time and now wife um, uh, moved to Chicago to be part of the movement that had <clears throat> elected Harold Washington. Uh, it, was, you know, it was the Reagan era and it was pretty bleak around the country and when Harold Washington got elected and um, Stephanie had just graduated, we said, it looks like the place to move to. So. <laughs> anyway, but um, uh, so uh, and you know, so most of most of our many years in Chicago, we were community activists, and we were involved in our unions, and you know, we marched against wars whenever they came up, and you know, we like most people, we you know, most people in the movement, we were sympathetic to the you know to all of the different nations and peoples who were being oppressed by the United States, the Palestinians, the Colombians, you know, the Salvadorans, the Nicaraguans, whoever the current war was, yeah. Yeah. Um, and. Uh, uh, and, you know, we always felt that we should be given more recognition <laughs> for, what you were, for what you were doing. <laughs> this wasn't quite what we had in mind. But anyway, so on, on the morning of Friday, September 24, 2010, um, we were getting ready for work. Our teenage son had left for high school already, and 7 o'clock, a door, and someone knocked on the door, and I, you know, was sleeping in a little bit, so I pulled on my jeans and went down the stairs, and there's a bunch of people standing on the front porch. Um, and I thought they were Mormons, you know, like maybe it was doing an early morning thing, you know, but I couldn't, or maybe the city, like maybe there was a, a break in the, you know, water main or something, like why would there be all these people in kind of office casual, standing on the front porch, and I opened the door and the man in front showed me his big FBI badge. They're really big, they're like this big when they unfold them. 
Um, and he said, we're with the FBI, um, we're here to search your home. Um, and he handed me a warrant. And, um, and I kind of went into a, a state of fog um, and you know, began to read the warrant. And it said that Stephanie and I were uh, under investigation for a, a conspiracy to provide material support to foreign terrorist organizations in Palestine and Colombia. And we, you know, and I, I don't know, after about a count of two, you know, I turned and yelled up the stairs to Stephanie. I said, Stephanie, it's the thought police. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, we've been thinking the wrong thing all these years and, and we're in trouble for it. Um, and after that, you know, we, we had to let them in because they had a warrant and then they handed us subpoenas to appear in front of a grand jury and, you know, I've, I had heard about all the people who had been subpoenaed to grand juries and I kind of knew that, you know, the history, you know, I'd heard of grand juries before but I didn't really know what they were. I assumed it was like a jury, you know, where, you know, where you got a judge and a lawyer and, but there's no judge and there's no lawyer. It's just a prosecutor and 23 people that they've hand selected and they bring in people to question and, and you don't have the right to have your lawyer there. And in fact, you don't have the right not to answer their questions. The Fifth Amendment doesn't apply. Um, in, a, in the prosecutorial ter, uh, tool called the grand jury. Um, found that out in the days following that. But at the time, um, you know, all I knew was that there were at least, you know, there were first six um, FBI agents, and then they came into our house, followed by six more, um, and they basically proceeded to um, search every inch of our home from the basement to the attic. Uh, and at lunchtime, some of them took off and t 10 more of them showed up. So in the course of the day, 25 FBI agents um, searched our home and they were there for 12 hours. Now, um, Stephanie and I have been, you know, activists, actually she was an activist as a kid. Her parent were, parents were movement people, but, her, you know, my, my parents were farmers. We didn't, we didn't, I don't want to say that farmers aren't political. My parents were not political. And, you know, we were I, I was never got never got involved until college, but um, but uh, but we're historians or pack rats. Um, so when the FBI left at 6:30 that evening, they took 35 boxes of papers and personal belongings. They seized our cell phones, our passports, our computers, um, and uh, uh, and you know we were pretty traumatized by the whole thing. Um, you know, it took us several hours that morning to figure out that we weren't the only ones being raided, that they were simultaneously raiding five other homes and an office of an anti-war um, organization. Um, that five, I'm sorry, five other homes in the Twin Cities, one other home in Chicago, and an anti-war office in, uh, in the Twin Cities. Um, and and they were also, um, there were also simultaneous FBI visits in Michigan, Wisconsin, North Carolina, and San Jose, California. Um, altogether, there were over 70 um, special agents of the Joint Terrorism Task Force, which is a multi-agency um, group, um, including um, ICE, including U.S. Marshals, uh, including um, Oh, I forget the other, I have to, I might, whatever. whatever. Uh, there were 70 different special agents. They, they all make $85,000 a year. That's the starting salary for these guys. Eight, 70 of them in action on the same morning, simultaneous raids and visits. Uh, and like as we piece together like who was on the list of people getting visited, you know, we realized that there was really only one thing that all, um, I think there were 11 that morning that were raided and, uh, uh, you know, four others that were visited that morning. There was really only one thing that all of us had in common. We had all been organizers for the last big anti-war protest under George W. Bush, which was at the Republican National Convention in 2008 in St. Paul. It's the only thing that all 15 of us had ever been at and done together. Um, 
you know, now, now, you know, I, you know, I actually was the bus coordinator from Chicago for that march, um, and uh, and actually I spoke, I spoke at the rally in front of the state capitol in in St. Paul, uh, and and then uh, over the course of that weekend, three more people got subpoenaed. They didn't raid their homes, but they subpoenaed them to the grand jury, and. Uh, uh, and then, you know, so we, we all had to make a decision about appearing in front of this grand jury. Oh, yeah. So, you, so you, the Fifth Amendment and a grand jury, um, okay, so you actually can invoke the Fifth Amendment and refuse to testify to a grand jury, but all the prosecutor has to do is say, um, I've got a judge to grant you what they call use immunity. So nothing that, you, that I would say could be used against me but it could be used against anyone else that was um, subpoenaed, that testified, or that, that was subpoenaed. And anything that they said could be used against me. And, and my wife and I, you know, <laughs> my comments couldn't be used against me, but they could be used against her, and vice versa. So it was pretty clear to us that that was a jury that we were not going to speak in front of. But then we found out that if you refuse to testify after being granted use immunity, um, that you can be hit with contempt of court <coughs> charges, and contempt of court carries an 18-month sentence. So all, um, by the end of the weekend, all 14 of us that were subpoenaed had to be prepared to spend 18 months in jail just for refusing to take part in this witch hunt. And, um, and you know, uh, true to the character of the anti-war movement, every single person made the decision we're not appearing in front of that grand jury. So, uh, and it took like, uh, I don't know, a month or so, a month and a half before all the grand jury dates came up. Um, and then we didn't hear anything for a couple of weeks from the U.S. Attorney's Office. And then a couple of days after the election, conveniently enough, um, three of the women, most of the people subpoenaed, by the way, and raided are women, like t two to one, three to one. Um, and I suppose I have, I have eight sisters, and I suppose it's a fact that women do actually most of the work um, in the movement, so maybe that's, maybe for once they're getting recognition too, <laughs> in an odd sense. But, but um, three of the women were re-subpoenaed. Were, their lawyers were contacted by the U.S. Attorney's Office and said, these three, we want to come in, and if they don't come in, we will hit them with contempt charges. So, um, so uh, the, none of the women went in, but each of their lawyers went in to meet with the U.S. Attorney's Office. And uh, we learned a number of things from that. We haven't publicized all of it because, um, you know, lawyer-client privilege you know, we don't want our lawyers to be hit with contempt charges. But um, the one thing that we did let people know is that what the U.S. Attorney's Office is most fixated on was delegations that a number of us, not all of us, but a number of us went on to the West Bank um, in support of Palestinian human rights. And um, in these delegations, um, the host in Palestine was a women's group that has centers around the West Bank, and actually still in Gaza, but none of us could get into Gaza. But um, I've never been, neither has my wife, but you know, we, we helped raise money to send people over there. Anyway, and apparently the small amounts of money that, um, that uh, were given to this women's center to provide the, you know, the, the translation and to set up the, you know, the visits to you know, the, the families of political prisoners or you know the, the families of of uh, you know widow you know widows whose children you know whose husbands have been killed by the Israelis or you know different or to visit their the other women's centers. This this women's committee coordinated that and you know provided the falafel and so the little bits of money that went went to them. Um, the U.S. attorney was really focusing on this, and and that's I want to jump back for a second. So. What they are alleging, they've never actually brought charges against us. Two and a half years later, we've never been charged. But what they're alleging is that we've provided material support to foreign terrorist organizations. 
I'm, I had never heard this expression either, or you know, I've read it, but I just didn't really grasp what it meant. This actually is a felony and carries with it a minimum of 15 years in prison, if you're convicted of it, for every charge. Uh, they never brought charges, but if they did, you know, this is, this, is, this is some serious jail time. And with federal charges, there's no time off for good behavior. If you get convicted for this, that's how long you're going in for. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, we've learned a lot about it um, in the period since then. One other thing we learned is that the summer before the raids, the, um, the Supreme Court actually made a decision in a case called Holder versus Humanitarian uh, Law Project. And um, raise your hands if you recognize the name Holder. Anybody know what job he has? Yeah. <laughs> He's the Attorney General. It's called Holder versus Humanitarian Law Project because it was his case. <clears throat> and in this case, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, basically a group of um, Kurdish American business people wanted to provide counseling to the Kurdistan Workers Party. I don't know if you know this, but there's about uh, 50 organizations that the United States government has on their list of foreign terrorist organizations. You know, it's not just Al-Qaeda, it's a lot of groups. Um, and the Kurdistan Workers' Party is one of them. So this group of American businessmen wanted to counsel the Kurdish, Kurdish Workers' Party how to work through the system, through the United Nations, how to give up their guns and instead take a peaceful route to achieve their goal of justice for, Kur for Kurdish people, for Kurdistan. And, <clears throat> and, uh, uh, and, and this was, you know, they, 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 they applied to be able to do this, and the U.S. State Department's position was, <clears throat> the U.S. Justice Department's position was, no, that was providing material support to a foreign terrorist organization. And so this, the, the Center for Constitutional Rights actually took this case, and they, this is actually, a, a, it was a 12-year-old case by the time it got to the Supreme Court, they won at uh, the, the local level, whatever the, you know, the, the magistrate, <clears throat> they won in the appeals court, and at each level, the U.S. attorney um, would appeal it to the next level, and finally the U.S. attorney appealed it to the Supreme Court. And uh, in June, before we were raided, the Supreme Court heard that case, and they decided that yes, um, and the, way, the language that they used was, speech itself can be considered material support for a foreign terrorist organization if it's done, directed by, directed to, or in coordination with an organization on that list. Um, so even if you're you know, advocating for peaceful change, even if you're um, providing no material support. I mean, when you think of material support, you think money, guns, drugs, you know, something. N no, speech itself. And, and guess who the prosecutor was that, that uh, back, okay, so this case was argued in January of 2010. <clears throat> um, Holder sent in Elena Kagan to argue the U.S. position. So Kagan um, actually said, uh, about, for example, um, Hamas, the duly elected party that is in the government in Gaza. She said, <clears throat> um, Hamas builds hospitals, Hamas builds bombs. If, if somebody in the U.S. were to help Hamas build hospitals, they're freeing up their ability to build more bombs. So therefore, having any contact with the government of Gaza makes you guilty of providing material support to a foreign terrorist organization and therefore, you know, you could be facing 15 years in prison, um, uh, for example. <clears throat> so, w I don't think any of us really understood, you know, all of this when we were raided. Um, but we knew that what we had done in opposing, you know, wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and being sympathizers with the Palestinians and, the, you know, the people of Colombia, that that there's nothing morally wrong with that. And furthermore, you know, we don't even think we're criminals. We think that 
you know, we're, this is a this, this is a witch hunt. So, um, so the three women were 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 their their lawyers were brought in and, and they were threatened with um, imprisonment and they still refused uh, to testify in front of the grand jury. So then in December, um, the U.S. attorney subpoenaed nine more people. Now, the average age of those of us who were subpoenaed in September was about 50. The average age of the people they subpoenaed in December was about 22. They couldn't get any of the old people, to, uh, so they went after the kids. And um, one of the people that was raided with, with us is Palestinian, Palestinian-American. Six of the young people are Palestinian-American. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, I don't, I'm sure you're aware that that, uh, that there's a war against Muslims going on in this country. And they are, as a community, um, terrified to be identified. So they've actually, they, they've never identified themselves. Those six uh, Palestinian um, youth have never said their names publicly. So um, I know them all, but, but uh, they're not in the press. But all nine of them also refused to appear in front of the grand jury. So, um, so the you know what's a what's a federal prosecutor to do you know without anyone to talk to their grand jury and it really became clear to us that this grand jury is really you know uh, designed to um, justify uh, this witch hunt. So th we we found out too in the course of of, of this um, of this the passage of time <clears throat> that uh, our anti-war coalition had been infiltrated by. Uh, a federal agent, or a, 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 a law enforcement agent. Um, so we were the group, by the way, going back to the protest at the Republican National Convention, we were the group that organized the peaceful, legal protests. We didn't even do civil disobedience. All we did was organize the permitted march from the state capitol to the... Um, to the, uh, the the Alliance Center where they were um, holding the the Republican convention and then back. Uh, that's it. Well, we found out that they had sent in an undercover agent to join that peace coalition in March or April of 2008. Um, and that woman, um, and actually eventually her uh, girlfriend, uh, stuck around for two and a half years and became a core anti-war activist in the Twin Cities. Um, so active that in fact I'm also a member of a, of a socialist group called Freedom Road Socialist Organization. We recruited her to be a member, and she was one of the most devoted people. We were like, well, are you a socialist? Oh, well, you should join us. So she actually joined you know, a number of groups. And then she disappeared just a few days before the raids. Um, and we've not heard from or seen her again, whatever her real name is. She went by the name Karen Sullivan. But for two and a half years, they had this investigation going on. Um, and in fact, we, they started this grand jury like one year before they raided us. So they had, it wasn't just the 70 agents in the field that day. They had had this enormous operation going on, spying on us, investigating us. You know, you know, I can't calculate, I have no real way of knowing the millions of dollars that they've spent on this. So, so anyway, um, the, the, uh, um, two last things to just tell about the, about the story and then I'll, I'll, I'll close and, and take questions. Um, so, um, so that was September, in February, or early March, um, late February, early March of 2011, one of the places, one of the houses that was raided Actually, um, you know, uh, the, the, our, my, my old friend Mick Kelly, who stood up uh, for me at, at, at my wedding, um, his home was raided. And, and Mick's home is basically an office, like many activists, right? He's got, his living room has file cabinets, his bedroom has file cabinets, so not much furniture, a lot of desks, you know. So, um, so Mick has so many, so many file cabinets that he had not had a chance to go through all of them because the FBI had gone through all of them, but he hadn't gone through all of them. Well, one day his wife was going through, she's an activist too, was going through one of the files and said, hey, what's this? And she found a sheaf of, of documents, a packet, 
It was the FBI's operation manual for the raids, which included all of the weapons. It had a list of the weapons that they brought in with them. It had a list of all their names and their cell phone numbers. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> lost their job, right? <laughs> As a result of this. And they had left it behind. But the weirdest thing in it was all the secret questions that they wanted to ask us in the raids. They were all typed up. They were in that list. It included questions like, you know, who do you know in Latin America? <laughs> who do you know in the Middle East? Mm -hmm. Right? And you know, if you lie to an FBI agent, oh, yeah. as Rod Blagojevich found out, that's perjury. Not, not even in front of a judge. Just like if you say, I, I, you know, well, I know, I know, um, um, Syed, I know, um, you know, Malik, and I know uh, Suhair in the Middle East. You forgot Suhail! <laughs> right? <laughs> Felony charges, right? You can't answer these questions. Anyway, um, we actually um, printed them out. We actually put them on our website. Um, not their phone numbers. We, didn't, we, didn't, we figured that would piss them off. But um, I actually, I, I printed them out. I brought the, the secret questions that they wanted to ask about us. Um, and one of the things you'll see in there, too, if you take it, it's on our website, but if you take a chance to look at it, there's somebody in the U.S. Attorney's Office or the FBI who thinks this is the 1950s because they're really, really fixated about Freedom Road Socialist Organization. They talk about us in here like we're some kind of criminal conspiracy. You know, it's, it's odd. It's like a McCarthyite thing. So. So we found this, and then, um, anyway, but no one went to their grand jury. So then in May, um, the, uh, they, uh, they, they, they raided one more house in Los Angeles. Only, uh, this one was a little bit different. Um, when the, um, our, our friend, Carlos Montes, who is famous in the Chicano movement, have people ever heard of the Brown Berets? I mean, most people in most people in the Midwest know the Black Panthers, but the Brown Berets were the Chicano version. Right. Carlos was one of the three guys who started the Brown Berets. Um, he was the one who came up with the beret. Was his <laughs> idea. Um, he's in, you know, like he's in the movie um, uh, Walkout, you know, that HBO did five years ago. He's famous. He's a famous historical character in the Chicano movement. Well, he had also, we had invited him to speak at the protests at the Republican National Convention. So this Joint Terrorism Task Force crawled all over Carlos, and in May they raided him, 5 a.m., SWAT team, kicked in his door in L.A., you know, and, and, uh, and um, put him on trial on trumped-up charges of, of buying weapons. He actually, you know, I, don't, I know, you know, most people that I know you know, are not gun owners. Carlos is, <clears throat> but Carlos is, um, you know, was was not a felon. So you know, he lives in a dangerous neighborhood. He bought a handgun for self-defense. You know, I'm not defending it, what he did, but it's not against the law. Well, the, the FBI claims that they found digging through his files that he had been convicted of a felony 40 years ago in a protest against <laughs> Governor Ronald Reagan. And Carlos said, "Hey, I vote." I've been, a, I've been a delegate to the Democratic Convention. I'm, I'm not a felon. Um, but they put him on trial, and we actually had a, and they, they, they wanted to put him in prison for 22 years for being a felon and buying a handgun. And it was directly related to our case. We, we got the documents and proved it through, um, through discovery that they had no investigation going of him until they raided our homes and found out that Carlos had, been, and in fact, his name was on one of the subpoenas. So, um, and and uh, and actually, it's one of the one of the um, I, I brought uh, uh, souvenirs. We actually defeated them in court. Uh, it took a year and tens of thousands of dollars that we had to raise. Um, Carlos is the only one of us that went to went on trial, and and we won. They had to, um, they, they you know he's he uh, uh, you know it was a partial victory. It's all these, these things are a plea bargain, but no no prison time. Um, you know they had to drop. They had to drop. You know, step back from all the all those charges. But we actually made um, beautiful posters. Uh, and I, I brought. I have a bunch of leftovers. So I brought some of these, and you're welcome to have some. And we actually made free Carlos uh, uh, buttons and, and uh, wristbands. So if you're if you're into collecting memorabilia.
Um, the last thing to say is that uh, this investigation isn't over. Um, everybody has gotten their um, materials back that they took and our cell phones and our computers, except for Hetha Medvedeva, the director of the Arab American Action Network in Chicago and, you know, one of the most prominent Palestinian American activists in the country. The box of papers and documents that they took from his home that, during the raids, they've never returned it. And in August, coming up on the two-year anniversary, Hatham's lawyer approached the U.S. attorney and said, come on, it's two years, you don't have a case, just drop the, you know, drop the investigation and tell the public that you've dropped the investigation so these people can get on with their lives. And the U.S. attorney said, no, this is an ongoing investigation, criminal investigation. We're not, it's, it's not over, and we're not returning Hatham's documents. So, um, actually, this, this week, uh, we're, there's an article in The Nation uh, magazine that, that talks about our case uh, as um, an example of the, the, you know, basically the violations of civil liberties that are occurring under the, this administration. And um, it's actually a fairly hopeful um, piece. And I would like to be hopeful, but the only thing that I really have any hope in is the power of the people. Um, I truly believe that the, the reason that none of us were jailed uh, by that grand jury, by the U.S. Attorney for refusing to appear in front of that grand jury, is because, first of all, all 23 of us refused to cooperate. But second of all, because from the moment we were raided, um, it became, I think, I, think, I think that Pat Fitzgerald um, was a little bit shocked at, you know, I think he thought that if we put on the front page of the Tribune, you know, terrorists, that all of the people that are working with these people, every, all of their friends and allies, will leap away from them like a hot stove. They'll, I think that's what he thought, you know, that when they said, oh, they, they've been, they, they're supporters of Palestinian organizations, they're supportive of Colombian organizations, they've done all these terrible things, they're not really peace activists, they're violent. You know, they support violence. Um, I, I think he thought that people would say, oh, I didn't know that about them. But the problem is that we've pretty much told everybody, you know, what our beliefs are, and we've been telling them for 30 years, you know. But we're also popular. So, as a, you know, our friends rallied around us, and within um, a couple of uh, weeks, we had a, a statement that um, the AFSC and the Wellington Avenue United Church of Christ and the Unitarian Church in Oak Park um, activists got together and got a, a statement by faith-based activists and hundreds of activists just in Chicago um, signed it. Uh, and, you know, we, we, we started reaching out to our unions and it took us, you know, it took us a year to do this, but after a year of campaigning, we got resolutions from unions representing 1.1 million members, um, including the Chicago Teachers Union, including the California Teachers Union. We got resolutions passed saying, that they're greatly concerned about the violations of our civil liberties. We got 14 members of Congress to write <clears throat> Eric Holder or President Obama saying, are, you know, are you sure about this? And Dennis Kucinich's letter, um, I know that man can't get elected president, but it, I think he should be a saint because yes. his letter is just like, he just goes after the Obama administration and Eric Holder so hard in his letter. Anyway, um, and because of the support that we got, I think that the, um, the U.S. attorney, you know, basically had to say, um, the time is not right <laughs> to jail these people. But, <clears throat> um, you know, in the, two, in the two years since then, you know, we launched another war against a Muslim nation in Libya. And we're currently preparing for uh, additional wars in Syria, and the big one, uh, Mali, right? And the big one, Iran. Um, and uh, who knows if they can manufacture, or if another kind of 9-11 situation happens, they might come looking for their domestic terrorists again. Um, and so that's why I really appreciate being offered to, you know, being invited to come down here, because we need to continue, you know, to, to talk about this case. We're not done with this case. Um, and I thank you for inviting me, and I'll answer any questions that people may have.
Thank you for coming. So, I, I just have one initial question. Why did they take a document out of Carlos's box? Don't they have their own records? <laughs> what is, if, whether he committed a felony or not, it just seems like... You know, we, we, I, mean, I, I, I couldn't have explained this uh, you know, before it panned, but apparently um, the, the records of the court system of the state of California are not what you would think. For example, um, during discovery, uh, Carlos's lawyer found out that all of the proceedings from his trial in 1969, they're all gone. No one can find them. In paper form, they didn't have computers back then, they're gone. So, like, what did the judge actually rule? No one knows, except for the FBI has, they found one document in which it said the charge that he eventually agreed to because he did actually get convicted, but you know he says it was a misdemeanor, and he he, he didn't do any prison time. They didn't take away his right to vote, you know. And the police in in um, L.A. knew that he owned weapons, like he had, he you know he registered them all. They didn't stop him from you know from he has a shotgun and a pistol. They didn't stop him. So, but the, you know whatever the FBI um, found this, and 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 that's what they went with. Hmm. Okay. Uh, I wanted to point out, you know, technically speaking, all of us now could be arrested for listening to him. <laughs> but but about 40 years, I don't know, back in 60, 70, the FBI called on me. And as Joe mentioned, lying to the cops is now illegal. It didn't used to be. <laughs> but lying to the, any of the cops is illegal. So there's nothing you could say. And you can get away with saying nothing. The FBI called on me 40 years ago, and since I, my daughter had just awakened me and I needed to piss and I was pissed off, <laughs> I didn't think, I just plunged ahead. I got downstairs, they showed their badge, said they had one to ask me some questions, and I said, am I under arrest? And they said, no, and I said, you may go. And, uh, that is the thing to do. I mean, you got to do it. You prepare yourself. You cannot talk. You cannot tell them what the temperature is in your house. You cannot tell them how many pairs of shoes you wear. You simply cannot talk to the police. That's right. That's right. That's correct, especially the, the, any, the FBI or any federal agent, because they, this Joint Terrorism Task Force, which sits under Homeland Security, you know, when... when um, when I was a boy, there were 80,000 special agents in America. Now there are 800,000. And they all make $85,000 a year, and they have to justify their jobs. <laughs> so, so they're constantly, you know, raiding people, questioning people. This is how they move up, even if it doesn't result in anything, you know, by way of convictions or even trials. It's how they move up in the system. So, anyway. You're doing your part to deal with unemployment in this country. <laughs> I just wondered if you'd been covered. Uh, I, uh, you said the nation is writing an article. I've read about other of these cases, of course, and did somebody else cover you before? We've actually, did I read about we, you we've actually, actually, what's what's in the nation this week? And I, I, I forgot my copy. I must have left it in the car. Um, the article that's in there is called "Will Obama, a Constitutional Lawyer, Please Stand Up," um, and uh, it talks about a number of the cases of violations of civil liberties. And um, the the writer puts forward this idea that um, what needs to happen is for a case to be so egregious that it will cause a reaction from the public um, to say, "Okay, this is too. You've gone too far." And he says in the article that perhaps our case might be that case. Um, and I'd like to, you know, I like the power of positive thinking. I'm like, yeah, this is outrageous. Um, but I, I also, I don't want to be, I don't want to fall into wishful thinking. So I, I, you know, I think all we can do is continue to organize our communities. But, but oh yeah, we've gotten actually, we were on the front page of the Washington Post. Um, uh, in the, the summer of, uh, in June of uh, 2011, 
we had a New York Times op-ed piece that um, mm -hmm. criticized our case. Stephanie and I were interviewed on um, a weekend edition, uh, less than a month after the raids. What about at, Amy Goodman or any of those people? I was on Amy Goodman Monday morning after the raids, yeah. and I've been on several times since then. In fact, I spoke at the protest outside of the RNC in Tampa um, this August, and um, and uh, myself and um, and Carlos uh, and. Uh, Tracy Malm and Hatha Medudea. Uh, we were all interviewed, and you know they, uh, they had quotes from all of us, uh, both about our case and also about why we were marching against the Republicans. So we continue to get um, a certain amount of movement press, but in the first year especially, we had a fair amount of mainstream media. And th this is one other thing I want to say too: most of the people who are sitting in prison, and there's a lot of them sitting in prison under these material support laws. Most of them are Muslims, and they, when, actually, we had a conference about a year after we were raided, and we had the families of about half a dozen prominent Muslim, Palestinian, and um, Bangla Bengali um, families, and Pakistani families, whose, whose, you know, fathers or husbands, it's all men, but that have been imprisoned under these laws. Um, and these are not people who, like, you know, got tricked, like some of the poor young men who've gotten tricked into planting fake bombs by the FBI. These are charitable leaders, like the Holy Land Five. Um, if, uh, the Holy Land um, Foundation was the largest Muslim charity in America, and uh, the two main leaders are sitting in prison for 65 years under these same um, laws that we're under investigation for. What did they do? They sent money to the, um, the um, what do they call it? in? Zagat, is that the name of the charitable, um, uh, the charitable yeah. Yeah. committees in in every community, every Muslim community in the world? Mm -hmm. It's like you know, I grew Catholic. We had the you know the ladies that did charity. You know, this was the that's what. It's their equivalent of a tie. Exactly. They're supposed to pay a certain amount to charity. Exactly. And 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 right after 9/11, Bush had the Holy Land's offices raided in Dearborn, Michigan, and three years later. They came back with um, indictments for the five leaders of the foundation, and all five of them are sitting in prison. Mm -hmm. they, used, um, they used evidence provided by a secret Israeli agent who, who didn't even get to get his, his real name. They used evidence uh, from an Israeli agent in the court, and the, 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 um, the defense lawyers weren't even allowed to cross-examine mm -hmm. the, the agent. And these men are sitting in prison, the two main leaders, for five years. The, 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 the main guy, Gassan Elashi, is in Marion. What court? Uh, oh, the, they, um, this, was a, this was a, a federal, the northern well, the district federal, of Illinois. Yeah. You know, it was Pat Fitzgerald's office. Pat Fitzgerald was the prosecutor. Mm. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was wondering if you, I don't know much about it, I was wondering if you knew anything about in the Northwest, there were several anarchists recently summoned to grand juries. Mm -hmm. And they went through a process of refusing to speak, and I was yes. wondering if you knew anything about that. Sure. Yeah, we're we're uh, we've we've expressed a lot of solidarity with them. We've provided them. We 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 built a ten thousand person email list out of our defense work. As soon as they were raided, we we offered them. You know, our we have an online petition system. You know, one of the problems. This is just a little tip. You know, a little technical thing for any movement person. If you use move ons. Um, petitions, you don't get the email addresses. Move on. Gets them. So we went and bought the software and set up our own online petition. Um, so we have 10,000 more email addresses around the country and around the world. So as soon as they were as soon as they were raided, we offered them our list. We said, let's put up a petition for you, um, and we started, and it's still on our website, um, and we've. We've, uh, every time there's a new twist or a new turn in their case, we've helped them to organize call-ins to the prosecutors out there. Yeah, it's, they're, they're doing exactly what, you know, if we, three of them are actually in jail, you know, so if, if any of us ever got jailed, that's exactly what has to happen. The, the community has to continue to... Is this similar charges? Like, was it, do you know? It's, uh, it's, it's material support for domestic terrorism. They're not. They're not. They're, they're not charged with foreign terrorism. They're charged with domestic terrorism, but it's the same thing again because none of them have ever appeared in front of the grand jury. 
no one has ever seen any evidence. They're, we're not allowed to see any evidence. So they're, they've never actually been convicted of anything, they're just being held. That's correct. They're being held uh, for refusing to testify to the grand jury. Sorry. It's, I'm sorry, I keep asking, but is this part of the NDAA, the whole, like, you can be detained and held indefinitely? Is this, because I, I teach U.S. history, and I was teaching when we did a constitution unit last semester with my high school students, I was telling them about the National Defense Authorization Act and how the Obama administration can now detain you indefinitely for just saying you're associated or you supply material support or whatever. And Federal actually, officers with probable cause have been able to detain you indefinitely since the early 90s, it's not an Obama thing. Yeah, well, I mean, this thing just passed. In That's the since 96, right? Because of the effective death penalty act. 91, I can tell you that much. Well, 91, I thought, okay. I knew under, uh, under Clinton, the effective death penalty and foreign terrorist act uh, was passed in 96. But it's I, because of the clause of expediting before a magistrate, sir. If you can't guarantee the timeline, you're going to be able to expedite the prisoner before a magistrate. Oh, I know what court it's going to go to. They had to expand the... the timeline for federal officers because they can operate anywhere in the continental U.S. Okay. But anyway, but going back to the NDAA, um, <clears throat> yeah, the, uh, the indefinite detention provision, um, it, uh, it expands um, the powers. And, and I'll be, now this is actually, I, I, I have to be, you know, in, to full disclosure, we're not actually sure what they would have charged us with. We've never been charged. You know, we don't know. Are they going to use Holder versus Humanitarian Law Project? Or are they going to try to take these little donations to the Women's Committee of Palestine? Is that going to be the material support? You know, we don't know which way they're going to go. Or maybe there's a third way. We've never met the enemy in the court room to, like, actually find out what the charges are. But um, it certainly looks the same to us, the indefinite detention piece. But. Um, but you know, until they've actually done it, we don't we don't know exactly if it's the exact same animal or not. Is there any um, organized um, legal challenge to the behaviors going on? Good question. We we asked that question uh, as well the, the first weekend, and our lawyers, who by the way, the, the People's Law Office and the National Lawyers Guild, they are. Um, they are the best on these uh, on the abuse of the grand jury. <clears throat> um, and uh, Michael Deutsch, who is in the People's Law Office and sort of the grand old man of of uh, representing people brought in front of you know grand juries for political activity. Um, the, he and Jim Fennerty and, and and Jan Sussler they all said the same thing. They said bringing a legal challenge has a great risk to it, which is. Um, more than anything else, the U.S. attorney wants, <clears throat> wants to talk to us. We don't want to talk to them. We, you know, <clears throat> we're international solidarity activists. If they have us, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, if they have us, um, in, you know, in a sworn affidavit, they can ask us anything they want. You know, they can, if, if, we, were to, if we were to file a charge against them, well, they could they could call us in, you know, as a witness, and question us there. Um, and I, I, and I, so we 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 the, the advice that we have from our lawyers is um, that uh, they advise against bring, I meant bringing from a charge the, from a, like from the ACLU. Um, ha, has there been any external challenge? to the government's procedures in this? Because it sounds like they're almost operate, operating with impunity, yeah. that the, it's completely extra legal. Or, you know, the, the, you said that, was it a single judge or the entire court who said that um, talking to... Uh, the Supreme the Court was a decision, it was six to three. The um, okay. Holder versus Humanitarian Law Project. Yep. Were there any amicus briefs filed? Yes, in many. It? Yeah, you, you can you can go to the Center for Constitutional Rights website and read about um, the Holder versus Humanitarian Law Project. Mm -hmm. There were amicus briefs filed by a number of charitable organizations. Um, and um, the other thing I'll say is that um, there's actually two other sources. <clears throat> One is the ACLU's um, policy um, guy in Washington is a guy named Mike German, um, and uh, he's a former. FBI agent, in fact, 
his specialty was investigation of, of terrorism, terrorist organ, organizations. It was really, really, <clears throat> it was really comforting to meet with him and have him <clears throat> and have him explain what we were going through, and just like how how routine, you know, it is for for this, you know, for the Joint Terrorism Task Force, but um, and also to have him explain like why they do it. And one of the things that they focused on like, when they raided our house is um, they especially looked for any scrap of paper that had a name, a phone number, an email address on it. And, um, and they take that then to, back to their offices and they plug it into a database. And then they run the database back and forth and they see what the networks are. You know, so they're just on a big giant fishing expedition. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And um, and uh, at the same time, they also want to. You know, they also want to scare. Oh people. yeah. Um, yeah. And you know, I, I have to say it. It worked on me. Yeah, I'm pretty scared. <laughs> I was especially scared that day, but I'm still scared. You know, I uh, I'm um, you know I'm very conscious, and it's. Like, you know, I traveled with um, Hatham Abudea to the Republican convention in uh, the protests in Tampa. And Stephanie and I are not, uh, we got our passports back and, you know, we've had no problem flying. But when Hatham flew, his boarding pass has four S's on it. Just big S's in the corners of his boarding pass. And the TSA doesn't even know what it is. But they pulled him out of line. Um, they went through everything, you know, his underwear, his socks, everything, mm -hmm. and his, um, and then they tried to question him. Mm -hmm. And Hatem said, look, you guys, I, you know, I've been through this drill. You don't know what I am. <laughs> you have no right to question me, and I'm not going to answer any of your questions. Mm -hmm. So just finish going through my things and let me go. Um, and they dragged their feet another 20 minutes and then eventually let him go. And they even tried questioning me, mm -hmm. you know, and it's the same thing, you know, don't tell them anything because they don't even know what they're looking for. But anyway, the other thing is, and I actually brought a copy of this, um, the, um, the Department of Justice, the Inspector General, did a, did a report uh, just the summer before we were raided about um, the FBI's uh, violation of domestic peace groups um, and their investigations into you know, um, the Catholic workers um, and, you know, the, you know, and other peace groups. Um, so, you know, it's not, it's not like we're the only ones, right? um, and, and well, there was that one in the Michael Moore thing where they had this, like, the little lady society sitting around eating cookies and they got raided or something. Well, you know, let's, let's, um, let's, out of, out of respect to the sisters who are of my generation, um, you know, I'm, I just turned 54, so, you know, and obviously I, I'm kind of follically challenged, um, but, most of the peace movement looks like the people in this room, to be honest. You know, it's, it's not mostly, I mean, we had a lot of young people at the NATO march. You know, that's, that, a lot of young people came out of the Occupy movement. But most of the peace movement looks more like you and me, brother, than, than like those three. There, there really is nothing central. I mean, obviously they put a lot of forethought into what they were doing. I, it's just like, who's... I'm like you, you had said that they're, they're trying to justify their jobs. That they're sitting around, they have nothing to do, and they said, well, let's try, you know, X. Was there some central goal mm. that they actually had in mind when they began organizing for this thing? Or was it just one of those who were sitting around, you know, eating donuts and drinking coffee and came up with this out of clear cloth? All right, well, just like, okay, so number one, um, yes, there was an actual event that caused them to start investigating us, um, us, meaning the, the people who were, who were swept into this. Um, so every time there's a major national political convention, you know, ever since 9-11, actually even before 9-11, but especially since 9-11, um, the, the U.S. government declares it a national special security event. And that then justifies, you know, bringing in everything under Homeland Security to cooperate in um, watching for terrorists. So the Republican National Convention in 2008 was, in, was a national special security event. So they, they infiltrated, you know, every 
group. And for example, the anarchist uh, group in the Twin Cities, um, which was called the Welcoming Committee, the RNC mm -hmm. Welcoming Committee, um, they were heavily infiltrated. And they were raided three days before the protests even happened. Um, and they actually put eight of them on trial under charges of contributing to, you know, conspiracy to riot in furtherance of domestic terrorism. Um, was kind of a mouthful. A state charge, um, which is like the state charges that they have on the NATO 3, um, plus the one other one, um, here in, you know, in, in Illinois. Um, and eventually, in the case of the you know, RNC 8, the, 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 uh, the state dropped all the terrorism charges um, in exchange for plea bargains, and two of the guys actually did six months in jail for it. There's a few other guys that, that got caught up, like in that Brandon Darby um, case, that people have seen that movie, um, Better the World. But um, anyway, the point is that when they started investigating our coalition, we didn't do anything that interesting during the uh, RNC protest itself. But what, what we discovered in those documents that were left behind in the one house, is it, it says there's one line where it describes like the like a preface to the history of the case, and it says um, that the um, that they discovered that uh, that the that we were involved in providing support for terrorists, um, and what they mean is uh, the the undercover agent that they sent in met Jess Sundan and Meredith Abbey and other people in the Twin Cities who had traveled to Colombia or had traveled to Palestine. And they talk about it all the time because it's necessary in the anti-war movement. You know, people come in and they're basically opposed to you know a specific war. And you know, those of us who are leaders in this, we have a responsibility to say, you know, like like Oliver Stone does, to say, well, it's actually not just this one war. You know, there's this whole history of it, and in fact, it's not just you know the American soldiers who suffer. Let's look at the people who actually take the brunt of this, and and then in fact. If you stick around long enough, you really have to learn that we can't just oppose, you know, the we can't just oppose the war. We actually have to support the people who are in resistance to the war um, or the occupation, whatever the case may be. So that is what they focused in on: was our 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 support work for the Palestinians and Colombians. That's what they that became the legal crux of the matter and the focus of the uh, of the grand jury was uh, the delegations that we were taking to Palestine and also to Colombia. All right, I'm calling on people, but it's actually your... No, no, go ahead. All right, well, I'm going to let... Uh, okay. Go ahead. <laughs> just, just to say, certainly one of the ways we can support you is by building our visible opposition to the wars. And so just so everybody here knows, BNCPJ's regular once a month stand against the war is this coming. It's the first Thursday of the month, so it's this Thursday, 5.30 to 6. Uh, it's the green space in front of the Bloomington Center for the Performing Arts. So that's that half hour by drive home time. So, most, like I said, most of you know, but please, the more people we can build, be visible there once a month, the more support, the more background, so that there is public, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a public group of people here in, in this area that wants to go another way. And if there's, there's only a handful of us there, that's what it looks like. If there's more people there, it looks like it's more significant, and, and it's a, that stand is important. For everybody, visible resistance, visible public it's, resistance. And, you know, and 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 it doesn't just it doesn't just you know matter for our conscience. It actually matters to the government because they wouldn't be doing this. My wife and I, because all we ever did was protest, and it's obviously upsetting to them. My wife and I, we've never been to Columbia or Palestine. <laughs> We're just protesters. But it's really upsetting them. They don't like dissents. I think that's this is sort of the bottom line. They don't like it. And I think the reason they don't like it is not just because they're control freaks, although they are. Um, I think it's because they know that at key moments, if things get bad enough, our movement can really upset the apple cart. And the best example I can point to is by posing the question, why is Barack Obama president and not Hillary Clinton? Hillary was the front runner in 2007. Hillary had the support of her husband, you know, the most popular Democratic president in memory. You ever talk Hillary to her? had the. Hmm? You ever talked to her? Um, That's why she's not president. 
Well, I'm from Iowa. Tiananmen's are mountain <laughs> and I, everybody within a 300 foot radius. The, 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 the polls in Iowa after the primaries said that, um, you know, after the caucuses, mm -hmm. said that the reason that Obama edged her out and it was narrow in Iowa was because of the Iraq war. Because she refused to apologize yes, she did. for her vote yeah. authorizing Bush's uh, um, uh, uh, launching of that war. Yes, and did. Obama was seen as the anti war candidate. <laughs> it was the anti war sentiment of an unlikely group of people, you know, the people in the caucuses in the state of Iowa, that gave him his initial front runner status. I could be wrong on this, but when you go into the Oval Office and you take, you're the first female to have an actual office within the West Wing, and all you do is alienate all those people who are inside the Beltway, that might be really great for you getting one project taken care of, one project pushed forward, but in the long run, strategically, it's going to kill you. And she just ended up reading what she said. She would have been a horrible presidential candidate. She's not ever going to be a candidate. I don't know about that. Oh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> you have to convince her. I also want to say um, about having a visible Christian resistance. Bob Dole, too. Um, the um, uh, there's actually a, 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 an action that we're calling in Chicago for April sixth. It's a Saturday. Um, uh, it's a, there's a national uh, network of groups that are um, opposing drone wars. And we're going after Boeing, which has their world headquarters in Chicago. Yeah. They don't currently make a killer drone, but they want to. They have, they have a design for the next killer drone. The uh, military is supposed to start taking bids for the next generation of drone killer drones um, in 2015. So Boeing already has their design. They've already tested it. It's bigger. It can fly higher and faster um, and carry more weapons. Shinier and more fun. And it costs a lot more money. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we're going to do an action against, uh, against Boeing on the afternoon of Saturday the 6th of April and I'll, I'll send we'll be there. information. <laughs> Is it in this coming? <laughs> oh, I wish. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> Kathy Kelly will be there. She's good too. I, I wanted to go back to Gary Scarpy. My friend Gary believes in the Constitution, and he was trying to find an excuse for it. You know, I mean, I think we should believe that they know what they're doing. Yeah. I mean, they systematically know what they're doing. Yes. And I think that knowing goes back to the war against crime and drugs in the Johnson and Nixon administration. That is, there has been a systematic, intentional building up of repressive machinery. And your report indicating that it's good enough now so they can put in jail anyone they choose to for whatever reason. But they, but they knew they were building that machinery, and we should assume that they're intelligent and know what they're doing. Exactly, I agree. I, um, I, I, actually, I actually think the, um, the main context uh, immediately for the... Um, for the uh, the grand jury um, and the raids and you know what and the case they've brought on us um, is a more current war and that's the war on Muslims. I think that um, I think that you know the, the war on drugs goes back to the 60s and the two things have this in common. We live in an empire and most Americans are completely oblivious to this unless their kids get drafted or you know get forced into the military by economics. Um, but it's not just any empire, it's an empire that's losing. Mm -hmm. It's an empire in trouble. Mm. Um, and this, this becomes very clear in Oliver Stone's uh, you know, uh, documentary as well. You know, yes, we've, we've done terrible things around the world, and that's why most people in those countries that we've done those terrible things to hate our government. They, I mean, they might, they might be resentful or even like aspire to have the kind of material wealth that they think most Americans have. But they, they, they hate our government um, because they've suffered so much. Mm. Um, and one part of the world after another, they are driving our government and our allies and our junior partners in NATO, they're driving us out. And you know, 40 years ago, it was Southeast Asia 
And today, it's the oil-rich, you know, it's the Muslim world that is driving us out. And, you know, and when 9-11 happened, um, George Bush, actually, he didn't really think of this, but, the, you know, the, the government thought that we could go in and turn back the hands of time. You know, like, like the Vietnam syndrome was gone. And so, you know, a massive unilateral invasion of Iraq, you know, thinking that we'd get flowers thrown at the feet of our, of our troops. But it didn't work like that because the people of Iraq were willing to die in their hundreds of thousands to take back their country. And now the people of Afghanistan are doing it and, you know, and we're leaving there as well. You know, in, I mean, I don't, I suppose that they can call, they'll, they'll call it a victory, but it's not a victory. It's a defeat and every time it happens, the U.S. is in more trouble. In the 50s, when the socialist bloc emerged after the Second World War and then with the Chinese Revolution and the U.S. You know, empire was in trouble, they came after the communists. And today they're coming after the Muslims. Yeah. And we got caught up because, yeah. you know, they started investigating us for our anti-war activity, but I think they really got their dander up when they found out that we were pro-Palestinian. Mm -hmm. I think that's yeah. really what yeah. really, like, that yeah. motor yeah. them. Sure. So, yeah. I'm sorry, you, had, you haven't spoken. Have you had any kind of positive <laughs> feedback, or representation, help, anything at all from the ACLU, either nationally or, or in the state of Illinois, out of Chicago, et cetera? Um, the, or uh, where you were from. The, the, um, the, the, the national policy people, like I said, Mike German, you know, we were in his office within a month of being raided. Um, and the, the national ACLU policy people have been, have been great. We have spoken together on panels. They have provided us resources. Um, and, you know, in, in some of the other states, so there's four other states where people were visited by the FBI and the ACLU in California, in the Bay Area, and the ACLU in North Carolina have been involved in, um, you know, speaking and, and doing a certain amount of, of legal work. And they have done, you know, they have committed nationally to doing support work in the case that, you know, if any of us are ever actually indicted. But in Chicago and in the Twin Cities, our lawyers are the National Lawyers Guild. And, you know, I mean, I, you know, we, um, uh, you know, we know um, uh, Harvey Grossman and, you know, and actually, you know, I, I worked with him very closely during the efforts to get permits for the, I was one of the main national coordinators for the NATO protest this last May and worked very closely with Harvey getting permits from the city. Good. Um, so, um, yeah, but, but just in, you know, our, our lawyers are the guild. How can you be so positive about, I mean, you know, now we, 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 maybe we're leaving Afghanistan, we're leaving, we're not leaving, you know, we're leaving military there. And we, we're now in Australia, we're in, um, um, uh, we've moved into Africa, you know, I, I just, I guess I just really don't feel so positive about the empire. <laughs> well, the, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, um, my, my, my dad used to sing an old Bing Crosby song, um, which, you know, I'm not that old, but I, I liked it. Um, and, you know, Bing Crosby said, you know, accentuate the positive, <laughs> eliminate the negative, latch onto the affirmative. Yeah. And so that either that or, you know, I think we have to project as a movement, not mm, only self-righteousness, because yeah. we are righteous, but, um, <laughs> but that, you know, as Martin Luther King said, you know, the arc of history, the arc of justice, the arc, the arc of the universe bends towards justice. Um, and um, we're going to have a peaceful world. It's either that or destroy it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, I can't, you know, I have two kids. I can't look at the future like that. I have to say, we're going to win. Um, and that's just, you know, that's just my chemistry. It's interesting chemistry. that you said, you know, the, the, all the older people involved, but at the recent Martin Luther King Day um, lunch at ISU, our speaker said it was the young people that were going to do it, and the old people could just advise. <laughs> well, there is, there is, I mean, it, it, that, that is true, and if, I mean, I don't know if, how big the Occupy or movement was something. down here, mm -hmm. but um, that... I mean, I'm, I'm 54, and I've been involved in politics since I was 18, and the Occupy movement is the most inspiring thing that I've ever seen, because it came out of nowhere, and like some of their ideas, 
don't offend anyone, were kind of like unorthodox. Um, and I really didn't think they were going to work. And it worked. I mean, they just, they, they just, they brought so many people together. And for the first time, you know, I've been a socialist since I was 18. For the first time in my life, people in America can talk about class. You know, like it's the, it's not quite the same class analysis that I have, the 1% versus the 99%. I would actually say it's, it's more like 80% versus 20%. Yeah. But, but, you know, but it, but it's the first time. It's like not since the 30s has this country had a class awareness. It's, it's great. It's a great new development. Big on class. Oh, one more, one more. I, you've already spoken. Um, I go to a by monthly police meeting because I'm a neighborhood watch guy. And one time they had a, a speaker in, and he's a local, he's on the local police force, and his sole job is terrorism. <laughs> it's like we never got a chance to question. But he went on about it. That's all he does is he looks for terrorists here in town. <clears throat> What's he looking for? People like us? Or somebody can fly in the State Farm? Or? That's, I want nuclear I, power plants in an easy drive from this location. That's what he's doing. I would imagine that he, uh, he probably does spend a certain amount of time looking at, uh, at local peace groups. Um, it's, uh, uh, it is. When um, one, of the, one of the committee hearings that uh, the Intelligence Committee I've spent a lot of time in Washington since I got raided by the FBI. Um, and one of the things that um, uh, one, of, uh, one of Durbin's aides told us is that in one of the Intelligence Committee hearings four years ago, yeah, four mm -hmm. years ago, um, Bobby Mueller from the FBI was on the stand and he said, pretty much in so many words, um, uh, anti-war, pro-terrorism, we can't make that distinction. So, you know, they, they essentially, I mean, I think that they've proven it with us. They essentially see people who are against U.S. foreign policy as with the other side. I mean, George Bush said it on 9-11. Either you're with us or you're with them. And he sees, they see us, you know, as with them. And, and us includes y'all. You know, that's how the national security state sees the peace movement. Yeah. as part of the enemy's camp inside the United States. So, you know, we have to, we just have to recognize that there's no real dialogue with the national security state. There's no convincing them. It's just a question of stopping them. And we have to have a big enough movement and a big enough outcry so that they, you know, are concerned. Yes? Well, it's like all of these things are starting to come together. It sounds like institutional inertia that um, like today, you know, the, the, um, the xenophobic target of the day is uh, Muslim religious fanatics or, or whatever, and that internally that it could be anarchists or whatever, but that it's like almost that like it's nobody's in charge, it's just I mean, there's people that are organizing and using basic principles, and they and you consist of starting to develop a, 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 a vocabulary which they use consistently, and so on. But there really is at the bottom of it doesn't seem to be like it's like a, head, a monster with no head. Um, yeah. Well, you know, this is something um, again. You know, I don't know. Uh, I'm sure you guys have the same have, have had the same books when when you started that I did. Somebody told me when I was 18 that, yeah, the ruling class does not have a central committee. Um, they, there's, not, there's not a small group of men um, and women now, since you know, this is the modern age, who sit around and plan all of their attacks on all of us. Um, they, act, they act as a class. Uh, and they have political representatives, and they have, you know, they have their, you know, their centers of capital. Um, and they have different ideas. And exactly how, even the, in, even the raids and the investigation into us, exactly what were the pieces that fell together? Yes. You know, like, like Pat Fitzgerald wasn't involved in the investigation in the Twin Cities. It's out of his jurisdiction. He didn't even know about it. You know, he, oh, he probably knew about it, but he wasn't there. Um, so how did the investigation by the Joint Terrorism Task Force in the Twin Cities produce information that Pat Fitzgerald got, and why did, why did he decide 
to convene a grand jury? You know, and who is, you know, who is it, you know, who's, who's the McCarthyite? <laughs> you know, yes. Who is yeah. it who thinks that socialists are, that we're illegal? You know, yeah. who thinks that it's against the law to be a member of a socialist organization in the United States? I don't want to meet that guy, <laughs> you know, because that's not true. I mean, the Smith Act went down to defeat. It's not constitutional. So, so anyway, I don't know, you know, exactly what the different moving pieces are. It's not clear, but... But exactly what it eventually came to be, um, you know, I've kind of tasted that pear, so I'm kind of familiar with it. Could you explain the differences between a grand jury and regular juries? <laughs> well, sure, in a regular jury, you know, anybody who's been on a jury here, you know, or been... <laughs> I've know. been on both. I've been on a grand jury and a regular jury. Oh, well, then you explain it. Mine, mine was the county. This is not federal or state or any of that garbage. But a regular jury, they have a jury pool. And they call these people in, and you have the prosecutor and the defense attorney ask these people are trying to get a non-prejudiced jury, okay? When you're a jury, when you're selected to be on a jury, you don't get to ask any questions. You just sit there, and most of the time the lawyers go and blab to the judge, you know, what the hell are saying. And then you have to make a decision on the basis of evidence that's presented in court, guilty or not guilty. A grand jury is different. You've got 23 members. You don't only have just one case. You can have a number of cases brought before you. Whatever the state's attorney wants to bring forward, these are the cases they bring forward. You get to ask questions when you're on the grand jury. That was a big thrill. We get to ask questions. You get to ask questions. And what you do is you either indict or you don't indict the persons that are brought before your grand jury. Now, if you choose not to indict, that tells the state's attorney that he's wasting his time to go and take these people to trial. He could still figure out a way to take him to trial, but he knows he's going to lose. So those people are, it's like finding you innocent before you ever get brought to trial. If you indict, you say, oh, we think there's enough evidence to bring it to trial. That's not the same as a guilty verdict. It means now you bring these people to trial. So it's not having a trial by jury. It's having not a trial before a trial. It's like it's a pre-trial. Trial. It's kind of like a pre-trial. It's a prosecutorial it's, tool. Yeah, it's yeah. a way of deciding if there's enough. any point in having a trial. Is there sufficient... Do we have sufficient evidence here to even deal with this as a, as a question of whether our law has been broken? One here, difference here, here between... Is that it's more of a fishing expedition. This, he's talking about a state's... Um, I'm talking a, about the a, county grand jury. A county or a, a yeah. state grand jury. And our lawyers have you know, said to us that those don't have the same history as federal grand juries of being so abused. Um, but Sorry. there's actually, um, there was a TV show, it's still on, right? The Good Wife? That, that show is yes. still on? Yeah. Um, like a few months after we were raided, um, they had an episode and it was called The Ham Sandwich. Because there's a line that all lawyers who've ever dealt with a federal grand jury know, which is, a federal grand jury will indict a ham sandwich. 98% of cases brought before federal grand juries end up with indictments. So that was the other reason we were motivated Maybe not, not, not to appear. <laughs> yeah, so that's part of like the systematic turning out of guilty pleas that go along with these less evidence-based decisions. They get people who are predisposed. There's no voir dire. There's no one there to say, this person's an Islamophobe. We can't put them on this grand jury. Yeah. They want the Islamophobes. They yeah. want they want indictments. So, by the way, I forgot to pass these around too. So d during our campaign um, this last couple of years, we had a, had a bunch of musical artists that um, that, uh, and we we we're not actually currently r raising money because we're we we raised a, really a lot of money, and our lawyers are all working pro bono, so the money's just sitting in a bank account waiting for. If and when we get indicted, we can't spend it, but we can't, you know, we're not raising any money. So anyway, so I've got these fundraising um, CDs. If you, it's mostly hip hop and loud rock music. So if you're, if you're into that, I got a question about some of the future tactics of the movement. Um, I know, probably at the beginning of the Iraq War, in the early 2000s, um, you kind of reached like a critical mass with 500,000 people in the streets of. New York or whatever, mm -hmm. but it's kind of taken a downturn a little bit. What, what are some of the strategic steps? I mean, as far as, I mean, some of the stuff that I'm always thinking about that doesn't really get a, get a lot of play or people talk about it all the time. There's, there's rumbles here and there about attacking it from the budgetary angle. I mean, with, with the budget crisis that we're in now and 
cutting the defense budget, cutting the budget for the Department of Homeland Security. You know, what is that something that's in the works or people that are people talking about that? It, it, you're right, number one, that the anti-war movement is at its um, lowest point in the last decade. Um, and part of that is because, you know, the Commander-in-Chief is a pretty believable salesman. You know, he, uh, he, he seems to have ended the Iraq War, um, um, and, and he seems to be ending the Afghan War. Um, I mean, it is true, the, the occupation of Iraq is over. It wasn't his plan. You know, he was pushing Maliki to accept, you know, troops remaining for another, you know, uh, an endless period. But, you know, he, he wouldn't, um, Obama could not accept um, that our troops would no longer be immune from prosecution. Because if they were, they, the prosecutions would, they would, would open a floodgate. Um, but anyway, um, uh, absolute anti-war organizers, you know, especially in this period, that there's an economic crisis, that the American working class is actually, you know, it's suffering under, I don't know what the unemployment you know, rate is down here, but in, in Chicago we have a 15% that's you know, recognized, and in my neighborhood, all I know is when I go to work, in, you know, when I come home from work at night, there are young boys standing on every street corner with nothing to do in good weather, you know, not this weather, but in good weather. You know, that's like in, in the neighborhood, I live in a mostly Mexican neighborhood, 65% unemployment, 75% unemployment for people ages 16 to 24. They have no jobs. So those are all those people that they'd have jobs for them in the desert in the Middle East if they would just go over to their local recruiter. <laughs> so we'll send you over to the Middle East and we'll give you a nice job. Hmm. Yeah. So we have to we have to raise you know money for jobs, health care, education, not war. It's, it makes us it gives us an appeal that you know. In fact, the 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 the, pro t the march on NATO, um, you know, we had fifteen thousand people there. It's the biggest anti-war march in the Midwest maybe ever. It's pretty awesome. Um, and the main reason, you know, it wasn't really Afghanistan. The main reason that people came out was because of the defense budget. I mean, it was the Occupy movement that made that protest happen. And actually, that's, that's actually, for me, another reason to be, like, to be hopeful. Because, okay, when the Occupy movement emerged, it was really just about economic inequality. You know, you know young people who couldn't get jobs or, you know, who couldn't pay their school debts or, you know, just saw that, you know, Wall Street had too much influence. Um, and then when, when it was announced, when Emmanuel, you know, the mayor, uh, announced and, and the president announced that they were bringing the G8 and NATO to Chicago, well, the Occupy movement nationally, um, you know, Adbusters put out a call for everyone to come to Chicago for the protests, but it was really focused on the G8. Um, and then Emmanuel, who was such a hammerhead, you know, he, he really, he tried to pass these laws to greatly restrict freedom of protest and freedom of assembly. Um, and he caused a backlash, and, we, and he actually actually had to backtrack on, on those laws. We, we actually organized the backlash. But, um, <laughs> but then, uh, you know, but then I think Obama said, I can't trust this guy with the G8. This is going to be a debacle. So, you know, debacle? Debacle? Anyway, debacle. Um, so, so, then, so then the G8 was taken and, you know, met in Camp David, so we just had NATO. And the Occupy movement, like, like the weekend after that announcement was made, they were having a, a, a conference, a regional conference in St. Louis, and like 20 different Occupies showed up. And like one after another, they all got up and said, yeah, we were going to go to Chicago for the G8 summit, but now that the G8 is not going, I guess we won't go. And the young people from Chicago, you know, we had been working with them really closely. And the, actually, actually, I have to give credit to Rahm Emanuel for um, educating them about the connection between NATO and the G8 um, uh, and, their, and, the, and the Occupy movement. The, when, when the occupiers attempted to take a small corner of Grant Park as their mm -hmm. public occupation, um, the police moved in and arrested yeah. 300 of them, yeah. you know, over two know. weekends of protest. Yeah. And as the cops were arresting people, you know, zip-tying them, you know, and like, you know, hauling them into the, into the waiting squad rolls, we don't use petty wagonettes. I'm a quarter Irish. But, um, <laughs> you know, as they were zip-tying them and hauling them away, they said to the young people, oh, this is just a dry run for NATO and the G8. And the occupiers were like, What's NATO and the G8? <laughs> so, so then they get to the meeting in St. Louis, 
And everybody else is saying, ah, oh, yeah, we're not coming. And the people from Chicago said, no, don't you understand? NATO is the armed wing of the G8. They're the muscle for the bankers. <laughs> and Occupy said, oh, okay. So, <laughs> so they, sh they showed up at the protest. They were the main, they were the main backbone of the protest. I mean, we built it very broadly. We got, you know, the, um, the you know, SEIU and the teachers union and the nurses union, they all endorsed and Jesse Jackson marched with us and the Iraq and Afghan vets, you know, marched at the front of it. But in terms of like the crowd, um, it was it was your Occupy crowd. Yeah. So from my understanding, there was a permitted march, and then like the weekend before, the days before that, there were unpermitted marches and every like night. skirmishes every in the night. Streets. Thousand people every, every night. Fifteen hundred, two thousand yeah. marching back and forth. It was beautiful. Yeah, it was. But um, I had to be very careful about not getting arrested. Number one, because I'm already under investigation, <laughs> um, and I just don't need the stress. And number two, I don't really want to put my hand myself willingly <laughs> into the hands of the authorities. And number two, um, you know, we had been telling the press and telling Emmanuel that, you know, for a year that we were planning a family-friendly permitted protest. So it was really important that we stay on message and I had become one of the spokespersons, so I, I actually missed all of those protests. There was just armed police to the teeth, right gear the whole nine. It was pretty intense. And then, of course, they, they carried out warrantless, you know, searches of the homes of prominent occupiers, yeah. uh, and they <coughs> sent in those undercover cops. By the way, I spotted those undercover cops. So did I. Three months out, um, the, they came to a, okay, allow me to, like, generalize. These two guys show up at one of our, you know, NATO planning meetings, and, um, all right, again, brothers, um, two guys who have nothing to say in a meeting, yeah. Like nothing, yeah. you know. Guys usually tend to talk a lot of things. And furthermore, they had really broad shoulders and big arms. <laughs> <laughs> they eat meat. A bunch of vegans that hang out with a bunch of vegans. Yeah. Black shoes. For the first time. <laughs> what are you guys doing here? And their story was kind of paper thin. They were like, "Oh, we were laborers before the economy collapsed, and now we're unemployed." Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. No beer, no beer gut? <laughs> right. <laughs> I don't believe it. Yeah. I saw them marching among the people. Oh, at the at the marches during the NATO. Now we point them out, you know. Oh. Yeah. I asked the National Lawyer Guild guys, what do I do about these two cops that are <laughs> walking among us, not talking? Yeah. yeah. And and of course the guys they they eventually, um, you know that they. Um, that they were able to trick into, you know, smoking yeah. pot with them and, you know, and yeah. talking smack, which is all those, all those guys did. That's all they did. Yeah. They talked smack. Yeah. You know, if talking smack and, you know, exaggerating your prowess, either as, you know, a militant or whatever, yeah. if that was illegal, you know, m most 16-year-old men would go to prison, you know, because it's, <laughs> it's ridiculous. Yeah. You know, but, but, but you know, they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna deport him. The Polish kid, they're going to deport him. You know, he's going to get out of jail on a plea bargain. Actually, he's going to, they, 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 Anita Alvarez. God, she's oh, a she, she, she sent her prosecutors in there to negotiate with the lawyers and say, yeah, I'll let you out for, you know, four months and then you'll be deported. And he plea bargained to it. And now they're going to put him in that, in that, um, um, what do they call it, boot camp for four years. Mm -hmm. And then still deport him. This woman is, is, is bad news. Yeah. She she uh, went after the um, kids with the peace movement, uh, or I mean I don't mean peace. I mean the uh, Innocence Project. Oh right. She wanted them to oh, show all right. the uh, from Northwestern papers, and she accused them of working so they could get a good grade. And yeah. oh, what is with her? <laughs> Are you talking about Madigan? No, uh, Anita an Alvarez, the the uh, prosecutor. State's attorney for Cook County. <laughs> Yeah, she's, yeah, she, she's a piece yeah, of work. She said they, they're just doing this to get a good grade, and she wanted them to show all their paperwork, all their, um, you know, any work, paperwork they need to do. You know, North, North, North West, and Northwestern forced uh, Professor Protest oh, wow. out of his position. Oh, they did. Professor yeah. Protest? She Protest, P-R-O-T-E-S-S. -E she, she was the head of the... Um, she did, that's right. Yeah. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. Oh, my God. Anyway. Um, is um, I, I, I one thing I can't seem to 
I don't understand uh, the arresting of peaceful protesters. Nothing really has been done. We really, you know, don't, that, that's not legal. Oh, well, in fact, um, I just got a check for $8,800 from the city of Chicago because uh, the night the war began in 2003, they arrested 800 of us without That's issuing right. um, a, a, warn a warning to disperse. Um, and, uh, uh, and we took them to court, and it took a decade, but eventually <laughs> we won. Um, and in fact, the city had to pay the 800 of us $6.5 million dollars and another $6 million to our lawyers, um, who, you know, who worked pro bono for a decade. You know, it's not like, it's not like they're just like, you know, eating that money. But, um, but yeah, you're exactly right. But, you know, in, from the eyes of the, you know, like, it's like the discussion we had earlier. You know, in the eyes of the, of the rulers, they take these risks because the immediate benefits are what they're after. They want us off the streets mm -hmm. because you know, hey, the people in Iraq have CNN too, you know, and when they can see that America oh. is not united around the war, it gives them hope. It gives them hope, like, you know, it's like Ho Chi Minh said during the Vietnam War, you'll kill a hundred of ours, we'll kill one of yours, and in the end, you'll leave. Yeah. Mm. You know, occupations can't win as long as the people there are willing to fight, and they have to have you know, hope, and if they see that America is not united around these wars, mm -hmm. it gives them hope. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the political, you know, rulers, mm -hmm. you know, maybe every, you know, every U.S. prosecutor doesn't understand this, but the, the president understands it. Yeah. They don't like dissent. It shows weakness. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like uh, arresting peaceful demonstrators and so forth. It, uh, you said it early in your report, you know, it's, you know, what happened to you scared you and probably scared 20 other people <laughs> around you too. And yep. it, it, it is partly just to scare people. Yep. And uh, also, uh, you know, in, in December of 1969, the FBI murdered Fred Hampton. The FBI and oh, yes. Chicago police. I mean, they did, uh, the Chicago police pulled the triggers, but it's the FBI that did it. Yeah. First with an infiltrator in the Panthers who lied like he was told to. Yeah. Then the FBI passed on his lies to the Illinois State Police. And then they passed on those lies, lies to the, uh, the uh, state's attorney. And then the state's attorney got a mob of 10 or so Chicago officers. And they opened up with automatic weapons through the out through the wall mm -hmm. of the bedroom, you know, and that it might have gotten away with it if Chicago Tribune hadn't printed a photograph too soon, which showed the wall and which showed all the bullet holes were in one direction. So you know, uh, his wife got a million dollars or something like that eventually, but you know, twenty, 20 years later. <laughs> yeah, okay. uh, but you know, I mean, they're willing to kill. And his, uh, you know, I think his son, growing up, you know, with that over his head, um, I mean, I, I know Fred uh, Jr. and, and Akua, his, his widow, um, they're good people, they're stressed out. Mm -hmm. Growing up with that, you know, just the, just the I mean, she almost died. They, she was pregnant with, this, with the boy, um, and they shot her. You know, she was hit by, by, by a bullet coming through the, the wall as well. You know, their that their entire lives have been sure. perverted. You know, have been damaged by 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 surviving that assassination. The Panthers were nervous like that. Jan drove two Panthers back from Chicago once, and she talked every so often. She remembers how it, and they till they got past Joliet, they started trembling almost every time they saw a black and white arm. They were very tense until we got further down. The street. These questions are insane. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's just, and they have specific it's questions yeah, yeah. erudite, aren't they? All right, so I just want to do one little bit of advertising. The, the one question they had for my wife, they, they didn't have any questions for me. <laughs> <laughs> they, only have, they only had one question for Stephanie. 
And the question they had for Stephanie is, where do the proceeds from the revolutionary lemonade stand go? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because, you know, and, and Amy knows this. Um, Amy and Stephanie and I have known each other since Iowa, 2030, a long time ago. <laughs> anyway, um, my wife has always been, she's an artist. So, you know, she's a teacher, but she's an artist, and she's always made artwork for the revolution, for every cause she's ever been involved in, she's made artwork, and especially she liked to make um, uh, screen printing, it was, she just loves screen printing, and so about eight years ago, after making, and she's always complained that, um, that the t-shirts that most union causes, or most causes take up the t-shirts don't fit women, they're not, they're not women's shapes or sizes, so she decided, I don't know, nine years ago to start her own screen printing on women's clothes. Um, and she did it just for, you know, in small batches, just for her friends and people that she was working with. And then she realized, hey, if I incorporate, I can get wholesale. Mm -hmm. So she incorporated and called her little business the Revolutionary Lemonade Stand. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and when they raided us, it was on a subpoena. <laughs> they subpoenaed the Revolutionary Lemonade Stand to the grand jury. <laughs> Is that free advertising or something? Like oh, where is it? The police just shut down the kids' lemonade stand just recently. Oh, oh that's right. Yeah, about. I heard about that. That was yeah, uh, I forget where on the East Coast, Florida, or something. Nice. Anyway, but so anyway, so when when we got raided again, we were scared. So yeah. Stephanie like shut down her website. She <laughs> she had she had her T-shirts in like the Heartland and every you know kind of movement kind of coffee shop and you know bookstores. She was selling she was sells like baby onesies, you know, with like Che Guevara and, you know, I love socialist countries and, you know, like that, she, you know, she sells, I mean, people buy them, people like them. So anyway, she went into all the stores and collected up all of her stuff and put them in boxes and hid them. Um, and like took down her website and like didn't make anything, didn't go to festivals, didn't go to, didn't sell anything, you know, for a year. And then after a year, you know, like nine months, you know, after like the, the shock wore off, she essentially said, well, F them. And we started looking for a storefront. And it took us about six months to find a storefront. And we sold the old house, which was kind of weird. After the FBI had been there, it was kind of not, it didn't feel like home anymore. We <laughs> sold it. And we bought this new house. And it's a fixer-upper, and it took us a while. But in October, she opened a storefront for the Revolutionary Lemonade Stand. And if you look on, if you look on Facebook, you can find it. And um, she's she still has her day job. She's still a teacher, but you know, at nights and on weekends, she's she's there in her little storefront selling political T-shirts and and uh, um, and happy making art.